Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 27. Of Crimes, Excuses, and Extenuations. Sin what? A sin is not only a transgression of a law, but also any contempt of the legislator. For such contempt is a breach of all his laws at once. And therefore may consist, not only in the commission of a fact, or in the speaking of words by the laws forbidden, or in the omission of what the law common death, but also in the intention, or purpose to transgress. For the purpose to break the law is some degree of contempt of him, to whom it belongeth to see it executed. To be delighted in the imagination only, of being possessed of another man's goods, servants, or wife, without any intention to take them from him by force or fraud, is no breach of the law. That safe, thou shalt not covet, nor is the pleasure a man might have in imagining, or dreaming of the death of him, from whose life he expecteth nothing but damage, and displeasure, a sin. But the resolving to put some act in execution, that tendeth thereto. For to be pleased in the fiction of that, which would please a man if it were real, is a passion so adherent to the nature both of a man, and every other living creature, as to make it a sin. Were to make sin of being a man. The consideration of this, has made me think them too severe, both to themselves, and others, that maintain, that the first motions of the mind, though checked with the fear of God, be sins. But I confess it is safer to err on that hand, than on the other. A crime what? A crime, is a sin, consisting in the committing, by deed, or word, of that which the law forbiddeth, or the omission of what it hath commanded. So that every crime is a sin, but not every sin a crime. To intend to steal, or kill, is a sin, though it never appear in word, or fact, for God that seeth the thoughts of man, can lay it to his charge. But till it appear by something done, or said, by which the intention may be crime, which distinction the Greeks observed in the word amartima, and eklima, or asia. Whereof the former, which is translated sin, signifieth any swerving from the law whatsoever. But the two later, which are translated crime, signify that sin only, whereof one man may accuse another. But of intentions, which never appear by any outward act, there is no place for humane accusation. In like manner the Latines by peccatum, which is sin, signify all manner of deviation from the law. But by crimen, which word they derive from cerno, which signifies to perceive, they mean only such sins as might be made appear before a judge, and therefore are not mere intentions. Where no civil law is, there is no crime. From this relation of sin to the law, and of crime to the civil law, may be inferred, first, that where law say a seth, sin say a seth. But because the law of nature is eternal, violation of covenants, ingratitude, arrogance, and all facts contrary to any moral virtue, can never cease to be sin. Secondly, that the civil law ceasing, crimes cease, for there being no other law remaining, but that of nature, there is no place for accusation. Every man being his own judge, and accused only by his own conscience, and cleared by the uprightness of his own intention. When therefore his intention is right, his fact is no sin. If otherwise, his fact is sin, but not crime. Thirdly, that when the sovereign power say a seth, crime also say a seth, for where there is no such power, there is no protection to be had from the law. And therefore every one may protect himself by his own power, for no man in the institution of sovereign power can be supposed to give away the right of preserving his own body. For the safety whereof all sovereignty was ordained. But this is to be understood only of those that have not themselves contributed to the taking away of the power that protected them, for that was a crime from the beginning. Ignorance of the law of nature excuseth no man. The source of every crime is some defect of the understanding, or some error in reasoning, or some sudden force of the passions. Defect in the understanding is ignorance, in reasoning, erroneous opinion. Again, ignorance is of three sort, of the law, and of the sovereign, and of the penalty. Ignorance of the law of nature excuseth no man, because every man that hath attained to the use of reason is supposed to know he ought not to do to another what he would not have done to himself. Therefore into what place soever a man shall come, 
If he do anything contrary to that law, it is a crime. If a man come from the Indies hither, and persuade men here to receive a new religion, or teach them anything that tendeth to disobedience of the laws of this country. Though he be never so well persuaded of the truth of what he teacheth, he commits a crime, and may be justly punished for the same, not only because his doctrine is false, but also because he does that which he would not approve in another, namely, that coming from hence, he should endeavor to alter the religion there. But ignorance of the civil law shall excuse a man in a strange country till it be declared to him, because, till then no civil law is binding. Ignorance of the civil law excuseth sometimes. In the like manner, if the civil law of a man's own country be not so sufficiently declared, as he may know it if he will, nor the action against the law of nature. The ignorance is a good excuse, in other cases ignorance of the civil law excuseth not. Ignorance of the sovereign excuseth not. Ignorance of the sovereign power, in the place of a man's ordinary residence, excuseth him not, because he ought to take notice of the power by which he hath been protected there. Ignorance of the penalty excuseth not. Ignorance of the penalty, where the law is declared, excuseth no man. For in breaking the law, which without a fear of penalty to follow, were not a law, but vain words, he undergoeth the penalty, though he know not what it is. Because, whosoever voluntarily doth any action, accepteth all the known consequences of it. But punishment is a known consequence of the violation of the laws, in every commonwealth. Which punishment, if it be determined already by the law, he is subject to that. If not, then is he subject to arbitrary punishment. For it is reason, that he which does injury, without other limitation than that of his own will, should suffer punishment without other limitation. Than that of his will whose law is thereby violated. Punishments declared before the fact, excuse from greater punishments after it. But when a penalty is either annexed to the crime in the law itself, or hath been usually inflicted in the like cases, there the delinquent is excused from a greater penalty. For the punishment foreknown, if not great enough to deter men from the action, is an invitement to it. Because when men compare the benefit of their injustice with the harm of their punishment, by necessity of nature they choose that which appeareth best for themselves. And therefore when they are punished more than the law had formerly determined, or more than others were punished for the same crime, it the law that tempted and deceiveth them. Nothing can be made a crime by a law made after the fact. No law, made after a fact done, can make it a crime, because if the fact be against the law of nature, the law was before the fact, and a positive law cannot be taken notice of before it be made. And therefore cannot be obligatory. But when the law that forbiddeth a fact is made before the fact be done, yet he that doth the fact is liable to the penalty ordained after, in case no lesser penalty were made known before, neither by writing nor by example, for the reason immediately before all etched. False principles of right and wrong causes of crime. From defect in reasoning, that is to say, from error, men are prone to violate the laws three ways. First, by presumption of false principles. As when men from having observed how in all places, and in all ages, unjust actions have been authorized, by the force and victories of those who have committed them. And that potent men, breaking through the cobweb laws of their country, the weaker sort, and those that have failed in their enterprises, have been esteemed the only criminals. Have thereupon taken for principles, and grounds of their reasoning, that justice is but a vain word that whatsoever a man can get by his own industry and hazard is his own. That the practice of all nations cannot be unjust, that examples of former times are good arguments of doing the like again. And many more of that kind, which being granted, no act in itself can be a crime, but must be made so, not by the law, but by the success of them that commit it. And the same fact be virtuous or vicious as fortune please saith. So that what Marius makes a crime, Scylla shall make meritorious, and Caesar, the same laws standing, turn again into a crime, to the perpetual disturbance of the peace of the commonwealth. False teachers misinterpreting the law of nature secondly, by false. Teachers, that either misinterpret the law of nature, making it thereby repugnant to the law civil. Or by teaching for laws, such doctrines of their own, or traditions of former times, as are inconsistent with the duty of a subject and false inferences from true principles, by teachers. Thirdly, by erroneous inferences from true principles, 
which happens commonly to men that are hasty and precipitate in concluding and resolving what to do. Such as are they that have both a great opinion of their own understanding and believe that things of this nature require not time and study, but only common experience and a good natural wit. Whereof no man thinks himself unprovided, whereas the knowledge of right and wrong, which is no less difficult, there is no man will pretend to without great and long study. And of those defects in reasoning, there is none that can excuse, though some of them may extenuate, a crime in any man that pretendeth to the administration of his own private business. Much less in them that undertake a public charge, because they pretend to the reason, upon the want whereof they would ground their excuse. By their passions. Of the passions that most frequently are the causes of crime, one is vainglory, or a foolish overrating of their own worth. As if difference of worth were an effect of their wit, or riches, or bloud, or some other natural quality, not depending on the will of those that have the sovereign authority. From whence proceedeth a presumption that the punishments ordained by the laws, and extended generally to all subjects, ought not to be inflicted on them. With the same rigor they are inflicted on poor, obscure, and simple men, comprehended under the name of the vulgar. Presumption of riches. Therefore it happeneth commonly that such as value themselves by the greatness of their wealth, adventure on crimes, upon hope of escaping punishment, by corrupting public justice, or obtaining pardon by money or other rewards, and friends, and that such as have multitude of potent kindred, and popular men that have gained reputation amongst the multitude, take courage to violate the laws from a hope of oppressing the power to whom it belongeth to put them in execution. Wise dome. And that such as have a great and false opinion of their own wise dome, take upon them to reprehend the actions and call in question the authority of them that govern. And so to unsettle the laws with their public discourse, as that nothing shall be a crime, but what their own designs require should be so. It happeneth also to the same men, to be prone to all such crimes, as consist in craft, and in deceiving of their neighbors, because they think their designs are too subtle to be perceived. These I say are effects of a false presumption of their own wisdom. For of them that are the first movers in the disturbance of commonwealth, which can never happen without a civil war, very few are left alive long enough to see their new designs established. So that the benefit of their crimes redoundeth to posterity and such as would least have wished it, which argues they were not as wise as they thought they were. And those that deceive upon hope of not being observed do commonly deceive themselves, the darkness in which they believe they lie hidden, being nothing else but their own blindness. And are no wiser than children that think all hid by hiding their own eyes. And generally all vainglorious men, unless they be withal timorous, are subject to anger. As being more prone than others to interpret for contempt the ordinary liberty of conversation, and there are few crimes that may not be produced by anger. Hatred, lust, ambition, covetousness, causes of crime. As for the passions of hate, lust, ambition, and covetousness, what crimes they are apt to produce is so obvious to every man's experience and understanding. As there needeth nothing to be said of them, saving that they are infirmities, so annexed to the nature, both of man, and all other living creatures, as that their effects cannot be hindred. But by extraordinary use of reason, or a constant severity in punishing them. For in those things men hate, they find a continual and unavoidable molestation. Whereby either a man's patience must be everlasting, or he must be eased by removing the power of that which molesteth him, the former is difficult. The later is many times impossible, without some violation of the law. Ambition and covetousness are passions also that are perpetually incumbent and pressing. Whereas reason is not perpetually present, to resist them, and therefore whensoever the hope of impunity appears, their effects proceed. And for lust, what it wants in the lasting, it hath in the vehemence, which sufficeth to weigh down the apprehension of all easy or uncertain punishments. Fear sometimes cause of crime, as when the danger is neither present nor corporeal. Of all passions, that which inclineth men least to break the laws, is fear. Nay, excepting some generous natures, it is the only thing, when there is appearance of profit or pleasure by breaking the laws, that makes men keep them. And yet in many cases a crime may be committed through fear. For not every fear justifies the action it protesteth, but the fear only of corporeal hurt, 
which we call bodily fear, and from which a man cannot see how to be delivered, but by the action. A man is assaulted, fears present death, from which he sees not how to escape, but by wounding him that assaulteth him, if he wound him to death, this is no crime. Because no man is supposed at the making of a commonwealth to have abandoned the defense of his life, or limbus, where the law cannot arrive time enough to his assistance. But to kill a man, because from his actions, or his threatenings, I may argue he will kill me when he can, seeing I have time, and means to demand protection, from the sovereign power, is a crime. Again, a man receives words of disgrace, or some little injuries for which they that made the laws, had assigned no punishment, nor thought it worthy of a man that hath the use of reason. To take notice of, and is afraid, unless he revenge it, he shall fall into contempt, and consequently be obnoxious to the like injuries from others. And to avoid this, breaks the law, and protects himself for the future, by the terror of his private revenge. This is a crime, for the hurt is not corporeal, but fantastical, and, though in this corner of the world, made sensible by a custom not many years since begun, amongst young and vain men, so light. As a gallant man, and one that is assured of his own courage, cannot take notice of. Also a man may stand in fear of spirits, either through his own superstition, or through too much credit given to other men, that tell him of strange dreams and visions. And thereby be made believe they will hurt him, for doing, or omitting divers things, which nevertheless, to do, or omit, is contrary to the laws. And that which is so done, or omitted, is not to be excused by this fear, but is a crime. For, as I have shown before in the second chapter, dreams be naturally but the fancies remaining in sleep, after the impressions our senses had formerly received waking. And when men are by any accident unassured they have slept, seem to be real visions. And therefore he that presumes to break the law upon his own, or another's dream, or pretended vision, or upon other fancy of the power of invisible spirits, than is permitted by the commonwealth. Leaveth the law of nature, which is a certain offense, and followeth the imagery of his own, or another private man's brain, which he can never know whether it signifieth anything or nothing. Nor whether he that tells his dream, say true or lie. Which if every private man should have leave to do, as they must by the law of nature, if any one have it, there could no law be made to hold, and so all commonwealth would be dissolved. Crimes not a qual. From these different sources of crimes, it appears already, that all crimes are not, as the Stoics of old time maintained, of the same allay. There is place, not only for excuse, by which that which seemed a crime, is proved to be none at all, but also for extenuation, by which the crime, that seemed great, is made less. For though all crimes do equally deserve the name of injustice, as all deviation from a straight line is equally crookedness, which the Stoics rightly observed. Yet it does not follow that all crimes are equally unjust, no more than that all crooked lines are equally crooked. Which the Stoics not observing, held it as great a crime, to kill a hen, against the law, as to kill one's father. Total excuses. That which totally excuses the fact, and takes away from it the nature of a crime, can be none but that, which at the same time, taketh away the obligation of the law. For the fact committed once against the law, if he that committed it be obliged to the law, can be no other than a crime. The one of means to know the law, totally excuseth, for the law whereof a man has no means to inform himself, is not obligatory. But the one of diligence to inquire, shall not be considered as a one of means. Nor shall any man, that pretendeth to reason enough for the government of his own affairs, be supposed to want means to know the laws of nature. Because they are known by the reason he pretends to, only children, and madmen are excused from offenses against the law natural. Where a man is captive, or in the power of the enemy, and he is then in the power of the enemy, when his person, or his means of living, is so, if it be without his own fault. The obligation of the law saith Seth, because he must obey the enemy, or die. And consequently such obedience is no crime, for no man is obliged, when the protection of the law faileth, not to protect himself, by the best means he can. If a man by the terror of present death be compelled to do a fact against the law, he is totally excused, because no law can oblige a man to abandon his own preservation. And supposing such a law were obligatory, yet a man would reason thus, if I do it not, I die presently, if I do it, I die afterwards, 
therefore by doing it, there is time of life gained. Nature therefore compels him to the fact. When a man is destitute of food or other thing necessary for his life and cannot preserve himself any other way but by some fact against the law, as if in a great famine he take the food by force or stealth, which he cannot obtain for moaning or charity, or in defense of his life, snatch away another man's sword, he is totally excused for the reason next before all etched. Excuses against the author. Again, facts done against the law by the authority of another are by that authority excused against the author. Because no man ought to accuse his own fact in another, that is but his instrument, but it is not excused against a third person thereby injured. Because in the violation of the law, both of the author and actor are criminals. From hence it followeth that when that man, or assembly, that hath the sovereign power, common death a man to do that which is contrary to a former law, the doing of it is totally excused. For he ought not to condemn it himself, because he is the author, and what cannot justly be condemned by the sovereign, cannot justly be punished by any other. Besides, when the sovereign common death anything to be done against his own former law, the command, as to that particular fact, is an abrogation of the law. If that man, or assembly, that hath the sovereign power, disclaim any right essential to the sovereignty, whereby there accrueth to the subject, any liberty inconsistent with the sovereign power. That is to say, with the very being of a commonwealth, if the subject shall refuse to obey the command in anything, contrary to the liberty granted, this is nevertheless a sin. And contrary to the duty of the subject, for he ought to take notice of what is inconsistent with the sovereignty, because it was erected by his own consent and for his own defense. And that such liberty as is inconsistent with it was granted through ignorance of the evil consequence thereof. But if he not only disobey, but also resist a public minister in the execution of it, then it is a crime, because he might have been righted, without any breach of the peace, upon complaint. The degrees of crime are taken on divers scales, and measured, first, by the malignity of the source, or cause, secondly, by the contagion of the example, thirdly, by the mischief of the effect, and fourthly, by the concurrence of times, places, and persons. Presumption of power, aggravateth. The same fact done against the law, if it proceed from presumption of strength, riches, or friends to resist those that are to execute the law, is a greater crime. Then if it proceed from hope of not being discovered, or of escape by flight. For presumption of impunity by force, is a root, from whence springeth, at all times, and upon all temptations, a contempt of all loss. Whereas in the later case, the apprehension of danger, that makes a man fly, renders him more obedient for the future. A crime which we know to be so, is greater than the same crime proceeding from a false persuasion that it is lawful. For he that committeth it against his own conscience, presumeth on his force, or other power, which encourages him to commit the same again. But he that doth it by error, after the error shown him, is conformable to the law. Evil teachers, extenuate. He, whose error proceeds from the authority of a teacher, or an interpreter of the law publicly authorized, is not so faulty. As he whose error proceedeth from a peremptory pursuit of his own principles and reasoning. For what is taught by one that teacheth by public authority, the commonwealth teacheth, and hath a resemblance of law, till the same authority controleth it. And in all crimes that contain not in them a denial of the sovereign power, nor are against an evident law, excuseth totally. Whereas he that groundeth his actions, on his private judgment, ought according to the rectitude, or error thereof, to stand, or fall. Examples of impunity, extenuate. The same fact, if it have been constantly punished in other men, as a greater crime, than if there have been many precedent examples of impunity. For those examples, are so many hopes of impunity given by the sovereign himself. And because he which furnishes a man with such a hope, and presumption of mercy, as encourageth him to offend, hath his part in the offense, he cannot reasonably charge the offender with the whole. Premeditation, aggravateth. A crime arising from a sudden passion, is not so great as when the same are saith from long meditation. For in the former case there is a place for extenuation in the common infirmity of humane nature. But he that doth it with premeditation has used circumspection and cast his eye on the law, on the punishment, and on the consequence thereof to humane society.
all which in committing the crime, he hath contemned, and postposed to his own appetite. But there is no suddenness of passion sufficient for a taught all excuse, for all the time between the first knowing of the law, and the commission of the fact, shall be taken for a time of deliberation. Because he ought by meditation of the law, to rectify the irregularity of his passions. Where the law is publicly, and with assiduity, before all the people read, and interpret it. A fact done against it is a greater crime than where men are left without such instruction to inquire of it with difficulty, uncertainty, and interruption of their callings. And be informed by private men, for in this case, part of the fault is discharged upon common infirmity. But in the former there is apparent negligence, which is not without some contempt of the sovereign power. Tacite approbation of the sovereign extenuates. Those facts which the law expressly condemneth, but the lawmaker by other manifest signas of his will tacitly approveth, are less crimes than the same facts condemned both by the law and lawmaker. For seeing the will of the lawmaker is a law, there appear in this case two contradictory laws, which would totally excuse if men were bound to take notice of the sovereign's approbation by other arguments than are expressed by his command. But because there are punishments consequent, not only to the transgression of his law, but also to the observing of it, he is in part a cause of the transgression, and therefore cannot reasonably impute the whole crime to the delinquent. For example, the law condemneth duels, the punishment is made capital, on the contrary part, he that refuseth duel is subject to contempt and scorn, without remedy, and sometimes by the sovereign himself thought unworthy to have any charge or preferment in war. If thereupon he accept duel, considering all men lawfully endeavor to obtain the good opinion of them that have the sovereign power, he ought not in reason to be rigorously punished. Seeing part of the fault may be discharged on the punisher, which I say, not as wishing liberty of private revenges, or any other kind of disobedience. But a caring governess, not to countenance anything obliquely, which directly they forbid. The examples of princes, to those that see them, are, and ever have been, more potent to govern their actions than the laws themselves. And though it be our duty to do, not what they do, but what they say, yet will that duty never be performed till it please God to give men an extraordinary and supernatural grace to follow that precept. Comparison of crimes from their effects. Again, if we compare crimes by the mischief of their effects, first, the same fact, when it redounds to the damage of many, is greater than when it redounds to the hurt of few. And therefore, when a fact hurteth, not only in the present, but also, by example, in the future, it is a greater crime than if it hurt only in the present. For the former is a fertile crime and multiplies to the hurt of many, the later is barren. To maintain doctrines contrary to the religion established in the commonwealth is a greater fault in an authorized preacher than in a private person. So also is it to live profanely, incontinently, or do any irreligious act whatsoever. Likewise in a professor of the law, to maintain any point, on do any act, that tendeth to the weakening of the sovereign power, as a greater crime, than in another man. Also in a man that hath such reputation for wisdom, as that his counsels are followed, or his actions imitated by many, his fact against the law, is a greater crime, than the same fact in another. For such men not only commit crime, but teach it for law to all other men. And generally all crimes are the greater by the scandal they give. That is to say, by becoming stumbling blocks to the weak, that look not so much upon the way they go in, as upon the light that other men carry before them. Lacy Majestus. Also facts of hostility against the present state of the commonwealth are greater crimes than the same acts done to private men. For the damage extends itself to all, such are the betraying of the strengths or revealing of the secrets of the commonwealth to an enemy. Also all attempts upon the representative of the commonwealth, be it a monarch or an assembly. And all endeavors by word or deed to diminish the authority of the same, either in the present time or in succession. Which crimes the Latines understand by crimina laci magistatus and consistent design or act contrary to a fundamental law. Bribery and false testimony. Likewise those crimes which render judgments of no effect are greater crimes than injuries done to one or a few persons. As to receive money to give false judgment or testimony is a greater crime than otherwise to deceive a man of the like, or a greater summy. 
because not only he is wrong that falls by such judgments, but all judgments are rendered useless and occasion ministered to force and private revenges. Depeculation. Also robbery and depeculation of the public treasure or revenues is a greater crime than the robbing or defrauding of a private man, because to rob the public is to rob many at once. Counterfeiting authority. Also the counterfeit usurpation of public ministry, the counterfeiting of public seals or public coin, then counterfeiting of a private man's person or his seal. Because the fraud thereof extendeth to the damage of many. Crimes against private men compared. Of facts against the law, done to private men, the greater crime is that where the damage in the common opinion of men is most sensible. And therefore, to kill against the law is a greater crime than any other injury life preserved. And to kill with torment, greater than simply to kill. And mutilation of a limba, greater than the spoiling a man of his goods. And the spoiling a man of his goods by terror of death or wounds than by clandestine surreption. And by clandestine surreption, than by consent fraudulently obtained. And the violation of chastity by force, greater than by flattery. And of a woman married, than of a woman not married. For all these things are commonly so valued, though some men are more, and some less sensible of the same offense. But the low regardeth not the particular, but the general inclination of mankind. And therefore the offense men take, from contumely, in words, or gesture, when they produce no other harm, than the present grief of him that is reproached, hath been neglected in the laws of the Greeks, Romans, and other both antient and modern commonwealths. Supposing the true cause of such grief to consist, not in the contumely, which takes no hold upon men conscious of their own virtue, but in the pusillanimity of him that is offended by it. Also a crime against a private man is much aggravated by the person, time, and place. For to kill one's parent is a greater crime than to kill another. For the parent ought to have the honor of a sovereign, though he have surrendered his power to the civil law, because he had it originally by nature. And to rob a poor man is a greater crime than to rob a rich man, because tis to the poor a more sensible damage. And a crime committed in the time or place appointed for devotion is greater than if committed at another time or place, for it proceeds from a greater contempt of the law. Many other cases of aggravation and extenuation might be added, but by these I have set down, it is obvious to every man to take the altitude of any other crime proposed. Public crimes what? Lastly, because in almost all crimes there is an injury done, not only to some private man, but also to the commonwealth. The same crime, when the accusation is in the name of the commonwealth, is called public crime, and when in the name of a private man, a private crime. And the pleas according thereunto called public, judicia publica, pleas of the crown, or private pleas. As in an accusation of murder, if the accuser be a private man, the plea is a private plea. If the accuser be the sovereign, the plea is a public plea. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.